煉獄の炎に鍛えられし千の刃Our story starts with a boy who has shut himself off from the world to escape the relentless bullying that he faces every day. As he lay in his bed scrolling Reddit with no future plans and no aspirations, a bright light suddenly shines from his phone and he is greeted by a goddess with a huge personality. She congratulates him on being selected to reincarnate into a new world. And he now realizes that he must have died in his room and ended up here. The goddess cuts straight to the chase and tells him that she'll give him a cheat power to make his life easy in the new world. She must feel bad that he ended up as a shut in in his last life. The guy takes it all in and declares that there is only one thing that he wants in his next life. That is for it to be peaceful. He still wants to be a shut in, just without the bullying part. So he agrees to be reincarnated. He wakes up as a baby and a king is standing above him, happy to have such a healthy boy. He praises the boy for being so healthy and having the royal mark on his chest. But then they measure his magic power. The king thinks that his power should be really high since he is a royal, maybe 40 or 50. But once it is measured, the orb only shows a power level of 2 and he has no attributes except barrier magic. So it seems that the boy was born with low magic capabilities, but his parents should still love him, right? No. They are worried about their image as royals for giving birth to such a weak baby. And just like that, they make plans to throw the baby. Looks like this guy can't catch a break. He was reincarnated into a new world only for him to speed run life. Meanwhile, the goddess is panicking that they are about to throw the baby. She gave him a cheat power, but they misunderstood it. She actually gave him a magic power of 1002. But the measurements they use can only show two digits, so it's going to be killed on misunderstanding. The baby has been left in the forest and he cannot move since while he's a baby. He tries to think of a plan for his survival and remembers that the measurements said he could use barrier magic. He starts imagining a barrier and light begins to congregate above him. And finally, a box is formed in the air. He remarks that magic is actually pretty easy to use. So he plays around with its capabilities and he is able to change its size, shape, and color. He is also able to apply it to himself and levitate. So now he's a floating baby. But then a giant wolf appears behind him and tries to chomp down on him. But the barrier is strong enough to hold it off. Since he is safe, he thinks of a plan to attack and forms several barriers to attack the wolf. But the barriers aren't able to do much on their own. So if he switches tactics and starts chucking trees at the problem, but the wolf still manages to get up. So if he brings out the big guns and prepares to drop an island on it. The wolf knew it was outmaxed when the baby started chucking islands at it and decided to give up. Later the wolf apologizes for trying to eat him. She just wanted to regain some magic power, but she didn't know he would start throwing land at her. He tries to respond, but he is still a baby so he can't talk at all. He thinks of a way to solve the problem and creates a barrier that can create sound and puts it in his throat so that he can talk through it. He greets the wolf and she asks who he is and what he is doing in the forest as a baby. He introduces himself as Hart and tells her that he was yeeted by the palace since they thought his magic power was too low. But the wolf sees that he has power that far exceeds the limits of a human being. She conduces that he must be the reincarnation of the demon lord, and while he is actually just a shut in, he plays along and declares himself as the demon lord. The wolf is now terrified and accepts her death willingly. But he doesn't want to kill. He just doesn't want her to eat him. She is moved by his generosity in sparing her life and squeers to serve him loyally for the rest of her life. Hart just wants to be done with this and agrees with her and calls her Flay so that he can leave. But as he is floating away, she calls him back and informs him that a contract has been created between them since he named her Flay. While he's trying to explain that he didn't mean to create a contract, a problem arises and he falls to the ground. He hasn't had anything titty milk since he was born and is starving. He asks Flay to help him and she does her best and turns into a human. But she is naked. Hart is embarrassed. He uses a barrier to make some clothes for Flay and Flay once again tries to provide him with breast milk. But her logic is a little off as she wants to mate with a 2-hour-old baby. Later, Flay apologizes for her rash behavior and Hart forgives her. But then someone is heard approaching them from a distance. Flay wants to kill them immediately. But she is stopped by Hart who wants to at least talk to them first. He creates two barriers that act as communication devices and asks Flay to confront the approacher. The person is a man, and when Flay asks him why he is in the forest, he says he is here to collect the baby. Flay refuses to hand him over and the man asks why she cares so much. She then proudly exclaims that she is serving the baby. The man is just here to rescue Hart since he is a relative of the king and can't just sit by and let the baby die. He even brought fresh titty milk for him to drink before he starves to death. Flay is angry that he went up to her since she can't make any milk, but Hart just wants the milk before he starves to death. 
Flay asks him why he wants to rescue the baby, and he responds that it's because he lost his own child and he can't just let a baby die in the forest because the king abandoned it. He wants to let the baby live in peace. Flat is moved by the story and starts crying her eyes out, and the man finds her behavior to be strange for a demon. Since she has made the baby her master, he makes a deal with her to hire her as a servant so that she can watch over the baby as much as she wants to. And Flay agrees to his terms. They then destroy the cradle to make it look like Hart died in the forest. Then to make it believable, he rips off Hart's cloth and pours animal blood on it to sell the COVID, but Hart still hasn't gotten his milk yet. It has been nine years since that night and Hart greets his new family in the morning. They treat him very well and he loves them dearly. But there is one problem. Even though he has been living with them all this time, he is still hated by his little sister. And he didn't even do anything to her. Flay walks in dressed in a maid outfit and prepares to serve the family their breakfast. And surprisingly, the little girl likes Flay a lot, which only rubs salt in the wounds of Hart who has no idea why she doesn't like him. She asks Flay to play with her later and she initially refuses. But then Hart orders her to play with the girl, so she agrees to the play date. The girl is ecstatic that she gets to play with Flay, and later she chases Flay in the garden and has a wonderful time. Hart is watching them from a distance and feeling left out. But then his mother comes up to him and tries to cheer him up, telling him that his sister Charlotte only avoids him because she doesn't know how to approach boys around her age. So it's not because of anything that he has done. After all, she is really attached to Flay. But Hart fears that something worse might be going on. Maybe Charlotte knows that he is actually nearly 30 years old inside and thinks he is a creep. He falls to his knees in defeat and his mother tries to cheer him up again by suggesting that they go shopping to buy a gift for Charlotte. After all, if there is one way to win over a kid's affection, it's bribery. But shopping is a bit too advanced for someone with absolutely zero social skills. But his mother is adamant that it will be a good experience for him since he is always in his room. And one day he is going to be a heir to the castle. So he needs to go touch grass and as his mother, She'll support him all the way. Later, Hart is in his room with a clone of himself right next to him. He contemplates leaving the castle permanently, but if he leaves, he has to take Flay with him. And Charlotte loves Flay, so she would be sad if she left. But if he left Flay behind, she would most likely end herself since her whole purpose in life is to watch over Hart. But if he stays, they are eventually going to put a bunch of responsibility on his shoulders. Something he really doesn't want. In the past nine years, he has been researching the capabilities of his barrier magic. And now he's able to make a clone of himself with it. But the clones still can't talk or move on their own. Just then, his father knocks on his door and asks him to come outside to learn the way of the sword for a bit. Exactly what Hart didn't want. Responsibility. His father wants to train him in the way of the sword. Since he still thinks that Hart's magic power is extremely low, he has to be good at something. So Hart tries to use his research as an excuse and his father is supportive. But he still wants Hart to at least try the sword. At first, he is supposed to attack. But his father is known as a war hero, so he doesn't expect to be able to get a hit on him. For now, he covers himself in a barrier so that he doesn't get hurt badly and then lunges at his dad. He surprises him and ends up smashing his sword on the ground and leaving a pretty big hole. He now takes an attack stance and tells Hart to try avoiding his strike. And Hart leaps into the air and dodges it. This is really surprising since normally you would need to be at least level 30 to dodge that strike. Hart does think that it is strange since even when he checked his magic power in a crystal that went up to three digits, it still only showed two, and the highest number ever recorded for a human is 77. So how can he be so strong? His dad brushes it off and is now determined to turn Hart to the best sword user he can be, and Hart can do nothing but go along with it. Later that night, the man is done training Hart and has a chat with his wife about Hart's power, and comes to the conclusion that Hart might be part demon. There are records showing that long ago someone in the royal family clapped some demon cheeks, and now there is a rare chance for members of the royal family to be born with demonic traits. His wife protests that Hart can't be a demon since he doesn't have a horn or tail. But he does have strange power and a demon servant. But these guys are decent parents. They aren't going to abandon Hart like some other baby-throwing people. They want him to be happy. And Charlotte overhears their conversation. Some time passes and Haruto is up in his room chilling. He wonders why his father has been so busy lately. But then again, him being busy means less sword train for himself so he can't complain. He hears a commotion downstairs and goes to check it out. And upon exiting the castle, he sees a bunch of badly wounded men laying on the ground and his father, seated like he just lost a game of poker and gambled away his life savings. He asks what happened here and his dad informs him that they had set out to lay waste to a band of thieves. They planned ahead of time, got the right equipment, and even laid an ambush. But yet they still got their ass handed to them by a bunch of thieves. 
His father doesn't want to be seen in his shame of defeat, so he asks Haruto to go back inside. Hermito turns to leave and Flay starts roasting his father for being trash since he was beaten by mere thieves. But trash or not, he is still Haruto's father. So he gives Flay one warning to shut her mouth where she may not have a mouth to shut anymore. He continues walking, and as he goes, he heals all the soldiers. That night, Flay is standing outside. Hermino's room and he can't get any sleep because of it. He opens the door and asks her what she's doing but she doesn't answer because of the warning he gave her earlier. He tells her that she can speak now. He's not angry at her anymore, but he can't let the attack on his father slide so he's going to deal with the thieves himself. On the roof, he uses his surveillance barriers to scan the city for any signs of the thieves and he finds them out in the woods having a drink. He wonders how they were able to defeat his dad's army and Flay suggests that there might be a spy among them. Not that it matters much since none of them are going to live past the next 10 minutes. With that, he flies off into the sky with Flay and as he goes, his little sister spots him at the thieves camp. Bucktooth over here is praising their captain for forcing Haruto's father to retreat and he starts gloating about returning to his home country after killing him. However, unbeknownst to him, Haruto was standing there and heard the whole thing. He freezes them in place with his barriers. But then Bucktooth starts running his mouth and we already know Haruto has no patience for needless chatter. His conditions are simple, answer his questions truthfully, or have all 206 bones shattered. After his interrogation, he finds out that the thieves are actually soldiers from the neighboring empire who were tasked with pretending to be thieves and attacking to cause mayhem. The captain starts begging for his life since he has said everything he knows. But Karuto, unlike Batman, has a no-loose-ends policy. He orders Flay to burn down the entire fort and the people along with it. As he walks away, he decides to send his father an anonymous letter tipping him off to the neighboring empire's plans. The next day, Haruto's father has received the letter and has confirmed that the thieves' fort had been burnt down. Charlotte asks him who could have done it, but he has already figured out by now that Flay was the one that burned the fort down. Upon hearing this, Charlotte runs off to go find Flay and ask her what Haruto actually is. Last night, she saw him fly off, but when she went to his room, his clone was in his bed. Flay takes the opportunity to brag about Haruto's immense power. Later, Flay tells Haruto everything that happened with Charlotte and Haruto now realizes that Charlotte must be incredibly suspicious of him. From that moment on, she keeps following him around wherever he goes, even when he's taking a bath. She keeps it up for an entire week and by the end of it, Haruto is now spying on her too. During breakfast the next day, Haruto finds out that his mother and Charlotte are going to be going on a trip together. But later in his room, the surveillance barriers that he set on Charlotte start going off because she's being attacked right now. Their guards got jumped and the assailants are now after them. Natalia is doing her best to defend Charlotte, but there is no way she can handle four guys at once. A barrier appears on Charlotte's ear and suddenly has a good idea of where to go as if she is receiving instructions. His mother wonders where Charlotte is receiving instructions from but she's not going to complain about being saved. They get to the edge of a cliff and Charlotte says to jump and left with no other choice, she jumps off the cliff and runs into the cave Charlotte had been directed to. And this is where she makes the dumbest decision I've seen all day. She leaves Charlotte in the cave in order to go find the person that was directing Charlotte and is almost immediately captured. She now decides that it's not worth it to be captured so she is prepared to off herself. Haruto arrives just in time to save her from herself. And now he's really angry so he blasts the attackers away. He then heads into the cave to speak with Charlotte and he tries disguising his voice to keep his identity secret. But she already recognizes his aura and calls out to him as her brother. She asks him if he is a hero of justice and he just plays along with it for now. He's still got to go deal with the attackers. No loose ends policy and all. Harvardo returns home where his father is receiving a report on what happened. He tries to play it off like he had no involvement, but Gold is still suspicious. He realizes that the Imperial soldiers must have been let into the kingdom by a mole on his side. Not long after, Charlotte and Natalia return and are greeted warmly by Gold. And Charlotte is finally warmed up to Haruto. Haruto is happy to finally have his sister's love. But Flay is jealous. From then on, Charlotte has been clinging to Haruto non-stop. She barges into his room and sees him looking at the surveillance barriers he has set up. And she thinks it's ancient magic. Haruto goes along with it to get the discussion over with, but Charlotte tells him that she knows where he can get some books on ancient magic. She takes him to the library and he is amazed that he has never seen it despite living here longer than Charlotte. She grabs a stool and starts picking out books related to ancient magic for him and they sit down to read it. Charlotte wants him to read one of the books to her, so she sits on his lap to get the full Big Brother experience. While reading, he is reminded of Anim and starts complaining about how he never gets to watch anything new in this world. 
Charlotte has no idea what he's talking about, so she asks him to explain what Anim is. He starts explaining it to her. But to Charlotte, it sounds like a fate fan trying to explain the correct watch order. Harbina worries that she's going to think he is weird now, but she is just even more excited to see something like that. And with that smile, Haruto knew that by any means necessary, he had to let Charlo watch an I'm. Fast forward two weeks and Haruto somehow managed to get an internet connection to Japan. He wants to give Charlo a chance to watch an I'm, so he logs into his streaming service and creates a child account to spare her the trauma of watching Boku no Pico. She gets her first look at an I'm and she is entranced by the colorful moving pictures. But there is one problem. She doesn't understand Japanese horror, thinks it might be hard for her to learn Japanese, but Charlo is a goddamn genius and masters it in just two hours. After two weeks, Charlotte has turned full on Weeb and Haruto is worried that she might turn out like him at this rate. So he decides to be strict with her and limit her watch time to only three hours a day. Charlotte is bummed out that she can't binge the whole season. But this is a necessary precaution to make sure she doesn't turn into a neat hormula, tells her to hurry up and come downstairs for dinner and at the dinner table. Charlotte is really sleepy thanks to all her watch time. Up to this point, his parents ask him what he has been doing with Charlotte to make her so sleepy. But she just answers that she's been helping him with his ancient magic research. After dinner, Charlotte keeps following Haruto around in hopes of him letting her watch some more anime. But no means no. He tells her to just go take her bath and head to bed already. Later, Hiroguno is also taking a bath and Charlotte is there as well. While bathing, Charlotte notices the royal crest on his chest, but he tells her to keep that a secret. And after they finish, Haruto heads to bed. But he can't sleep since Charlotte crawled into his bed while he wasn't looking. And from the corner of his eye, he can see his mother shipping them by the doorway. She's a firm believer of it's not incest if you're not blood related. The next day, Gold heads into battle to take care of the rest of the thieves and Charlotte is now sad that he has to go. Later, she asks Haruto why he can't just go and solve all the problems with his power. And she's basically asking him to create world peace. He wanted to keep out of all fights that didn't directly involve him. But if that's what his sister wants, then he will do it. She also asks him to become a power ranger, and if he's going to fight crime, he might as well go all the way. He sets up a camera for Charlotte to watch and flies off only to find the thieves hiding in a cave. So he beats them up. He is then spotted by Gold who realizes that he is a little late to the party. When asked about his motives, he just says he's here for justice. But internally he dies of cringe as time passes and he continues to beat up bad guys. He has become known as the Black Knight. Dark Knight was already copyrighted. After some time, Haruto has finally perfected his clone, and it is really similar to him. But when Flay comes to tell him to come downstairs, the clone is also similar in Haruto's laziness. Corvuto goes downstairs where his father is greeting the princess and prince, his biological siblings. The prince is a little piece of shit, and the fact that he will become king went to his head. He sees Haruto and decides to assert dominance by dueling him. The duel starts and Haruto scans the prince's level, and he actually has a pretty high level cap for this world. But that's still nothing compared to Haruto's. 1002. The prince lunges at Haruto, but with a level difference, he is too slow to actually hit him. However, he gets pissy about Haruto dodging, so Haruto just puts a shield around himself and takes the beating. However, the prince got too cocky and mocked him for not fighting back, which then prompted him to lay the smack down on him. He tries to fight back, but he keeps getting bodied so much that he resorts to using magic. However, something so weak does not affect him, and he can just absorb it all. If the prince wants to throw around fire, then Haruto would be more than happy to show him how it's done. But the prince has been scared out of his mind and gives up with that out of the way. That night, Shavla has really gotten interested in this whole crime fighting thing. She spots some bandits doing bandit things and she asks Haruto to go deal with them. Just then, Flay barges into the room to aid in crime fighting. Charlotte is hyped that Flay is going to be joining in on the crime fighting operations. She's going to the Robin to his Batman. Before they head out, Haruto warns Flay that she has to keep things PG and she agrees to keep the violence down. They pull up on the bandits and Haruto introduces himself as the Black Knight and Flay as the Crimson Knight. But then Flay forgets all about the PG rating and just starts burning the bandits to death. Haruto tries to stop her but she's still chucking fireballs like there is no tomorrow. He finally gets her to stop and tells her to head home for now, the bandits have had enough. Haruto is exhausted from having to both fight and save the bandits. But Charlotte and Flay are already planning the next attack. The next day, the prince is still all pissy about losing the fight to Haruto, but he realizes that he was stronger than what someone who is supposed to be level 2 should be. Just then, his butler comes in and tells him that he has to get ready for the banquet that evening. The butler also tells the prince to ask Charlotte to accompany him on the tour he is going to take tomorrow. 
The prince doesn't see a reason to take Charlotte since he isn't particularly fond of her, but the butler insists, so he ends up agreeing. After the banquet, Charlotte barges into Haruto's room with a clone that he sent to the banquet. The clone may have been made to deal with this kind of stuff, but it is just as antisocial as Haruto, so that banquet was the equivalent of torture. The clone is done for the day and jumps onto the bed. Charlo tells Haruto that the prince asked her to accompany him on his tour and hearing this, Haruto has to take some precautions. He scopes out the route of the tour and finds some cloaked people doing a ritual. He goes up to them and asks if they have a permit for their cult summoning ritual, but they get defensive and attack him. He decimated them, but they still had a trump card up their sleeves and summon skeleton soldiers. Black Mag is able to destroy all the skeletons in a single strike, but they reform themselves rather quickly, and no matter how many times he does it, they kept getting up. He then notices the cores on them and messes with it a little to get them to attack the others. The leader now has no choice but to summon his real trump card, a golem. Horbuto is amazed to see a real golem, but his all leaves him vulnerable to the golem's fist. He is knocked back and smashes into a tree. And after he regains his composure, he is then able to see the golem's weak spot on its chest. So he chucks a spike into it. The golem stops moving and the summoners are shocked that it failed. After some moments it starts moving again and is now attacking the summoners. Orbuno has rewritten the golem's magic formula, so now the summoners are out of trump cards. He gets the skeletons to tie them up and interrogates the leader on who he works for. But the guy isn't answering. Ormino isn't much of a people's person, so he gets straight to the point. Tell me the truth or I bury your team. Hearing the pleas of his subordinates, the leader finally cracks and discloses that they are part of the queen's summoner team. Hermuto probes further and the leader reveals that their plan was to attack the tour tomorrow and assassinate Charlotte. The queen fears that Charlotte will one day grow too powerful and end up challenging her power. Haruto hasn't pieced together then. All the recent trouble has been the doing of the queen. There are a lot of things going through his mind right now, but one thing is certain, that bitch is gonna pay. He lets his emotions get the best of him and causes the golem to start smashing the summoner into walls. Now with a clear mind, he thinks of the queen and even if she is his biological mother, he's done playing Batman. He's taking the Punisher route. The next day, the tour goes on as planned, but the awkwardness is immense. Charlotte tries to break the ice by telling Prince Lias that he doesn't have to be too upset about losing to Haruto since he never stood a chance to begin with, but that just rubs salt in the wound. After accepting his defeat, Lias is a lot less of a brat and is just interested in knowing how Haruto can be so strong. With no other explanation, they speculate that Haruto might be part demon, but there are no signs of any demon traits. Travelok confirms that Haruto has no demon traits and she can guarantee it since she's bathed with him. Shocking the siblings, Travelok asks if there is something wrong with it, but Leah says it's not necessarily wrong, it's just not normal. The carriage stops and they get out to see the wheat fields. And while the others are having fun, Peruto asks Gold what he would do if the Queen was after Charlotte's life. Gold had anticipated that the Queen was trying to get rid of him, but he would never have thought she was after Charlotte. But since she is the Queen, there is nothing that he can do about it. Arvundo says it might be better if the Queen just disappeared. But as wicked as she may be, she is still the strongest warrior in the kingdom. And if she disappeared, there would be a civil war to fill the power vacuum. But if someone else of equal power were to take her place, then it would be fine. Hermudo suggests that Gold become king, but he knows he is not cut out to be the king. However, he believes that Charlotte would one day be able to rule the kingdom well. Hermidot decides to protect Charlotte until she can become queen, and that means putting off killing the queen. But he still has plans to go see her. The queen receives a report on the failure to assassinate Charlotte, and she is not happy about it. She throws wine in the face of the knight and calls him useless. The knight tries to explain that the Black Mag has been foiling all their plans, but the Queen doesn't see what the big deal is with one measly vigilant. She thinks she might just have to take him on herself and put an end to this. And the chance to put her money where her mouth is presents itself as Black Knight is right there. The Queen's knights try to guard her, but they are immediately choked out by barriers. The Queen asks how you managed to get into the castle, since there should be several layers of barriers around it. But barriers are kind of Black Knight's thing, so it's not like that was going to stop him. She doesn't care anymore and just wants to kill him. So she activates three spells at once and Black Knight is actually pretty impressed. She creates a ball of water around him and tries to drown him, but he just jumps straight out of it. Next, she tries throwing spikes at him and when that doesn't work, she tries a fireball and she thinks she has finally gotten him, but Black Knight just gets up and goes, yep, that was fire, all right. It's now his turn to attack and he just casually pelts her with blast after blast until she runs out of mana to defend herself. 
With no other options, she engages in close combat with the holy sword that killed the demon king and she exclaims that she is the strongest in the world. But immediately after she gets disarmed and is now defeated, he still can't kill her despite how much he wants to, so he puts a collar around her neck that will kill her if she ever does anything against Gold or Charlo again and leaves her to wait. In her defeat, he walked in, asserted dominance, and just left right after. After a long night of asserting dominance, Haruto's threat has kept the queen at bay for five years, and now he is spending the day playing with Charlo in the snow. Not much has changed as Charlotte is still a weeb and Flay is still useless in everything other than the most random things. As Charlotte and Flay continue to play in the snow, Haruto and Gold have a discussion. Gold talks about how the queen hasn't made another attempt on Charlotte's life since five years ago, and all of a sudden, she started wearing a slave collar. At first, the other nobles thought it was just some weird fashion statement, but after a while, they started wondering if she might have been trying something kinky and got stuck in the collar. However, one thing is certain, with Charlotte now safe, he can continue to live his peaceful shut in life. That peace lasted for all two seconds as Gold tells him that he has to go to school now. Hermelo doesn't want to go and Gold didn't want to send him there, but there are factors that he can't refuse. The king recommended him personally and it was most likely due to Marion taking an interest in him. It would cause problems if he declined the king's personal offer. So he agrees to go. Gold says he can take an attendant with him. But before he can even think about Flay, Gold says he can't take her. He can't have her chucking fireballs in the school. Just that his mother barges in and says he can take her. But that is basically handing yourself over on a silver plate to the bullies Gold gives him some time to find someone to take, but Haruto still has plans for avoiding school altogether. He's going to send his clone instead. But the clone also doesn't want to go. But there is another plan. Since the clone can't use magic, Haruto would be expelled for lack of ability, and he would not have to go anymore. But the clone questions why it has to be him since if he gets picked on he doesn't have any main character powers to defend himself. So Corvumo compromises and promises to use barrier magic to make sure he at least doesn't get hurt. In a log cabin in the middle of the woods, Flay is wiping down the windows while Charlo is watching Anime and Haruto is playing video games. He then suddenly recalls something that his procrastination had led him to neglect. He's still about to find an attendant for the academy unless he wants his mom to go with him. While walking in the forest, Haruto comes across a barrier in the forest and walks into it only to find that it is the one he created for the skeletons to live in. What else was he going to do with them? After he defeated them five years ago, they swore their loyalty to him. So with no idea what to do, Haruto just gave them some land and chucked them into the wilderness. The leader, Johnny, tells Haruto that he can order them to do anything he wants. But what he wants to know is why. There are other monsters here too. The other monsters are from the monsters that Flay scared the living daylights out of. So now they live here and recover from the PTSD. Hordo thinks it's fine as long as they don't cause any trouble. But he is still surprised that the settlement seems to have grown quite a bit, and they've even started farming and planning to grow their population. Hordo starts thinking that Johnny seems to be quite capable, and if he manages to create a body for him then he might make a perfect attendant. He would be perfect if he didn't talk so much that Johnny notices the look on Haruto's face and asks if he may have done anything wrong. But Haruto denies it and says he is just impressed with how well Johnny is handling things here. Later, Haruto sits by the lake and talks to himself about how tired he is. He had thought he could just spend time alone in the forest, but that whole thing happened. And while he is sitting there, the golem pops up behind him and sits down. The golem is named Jijin and is a lot more soft-spoken than Johnny in that respect. Haruto would like to take her as his attendant, but I assume the academy doesn't make 10 ton beds. As Haruno walks back to the cabin, he realizes that picking an attendant might actually be really difficult. But seeing as he has learned nothing from his procrastination, he decides to forget about it for now. He returns home and Flay asks him what all this talk of attendance is about. But Haruno remembers that Flay isn't an option. So he tells her that it has nothing to do with her. The next day, Charlov starts coming up with new names for things and ends up maiming the monster village pandemonium. Elsewhere in some mountains, a party of adventurers is cornering a blizzard dragon, but the dragon starts to fly away, so they chase after it. The dragon then takes a nosedive into the mountain, and ends up buried by an avalanche. A blizzard dragon losing to snow is pretty ironic. Gold calls Haruto in to discuss something and tells him about the blizzard dragon that got wounded in the mountains. It hasn't entered their region yet, but if it were to go on a rampage, then there would be several casualties. So he wants Flay to go deal with it. But Flay refuses, stating that she only follows orders from Haruto. But even when Haruto asks her to do it, she so refuses. Her reason is that since she has never met that dragon, it means that it chose not to help during the demon war and she can't bring herself to talk to such a coward. 
After talking a little more, they exit the office and Charlotte was outside eavesdropping on the conversation. She asks Flay to please save the dragon. And if both Haruto and Charlotte are asking, she has no choice but to agree. They head to the mountains and Haruto begins scanning the area until he locates the dragon. But adventurers are closing in on it, so they have to act fast. The adventurers are about to finish off the dragon, but Haruto jumps in to defend it and heals its wounds. Flay then starts chucking fire at the adventurers who so far have done nothing wrong whatsoever. The dragon gets up and freezes Haruto immediately, but it's not how you thank someone for saving you. And after Haruto breaks free, he is really angry. The dragon can speak but ignores Haruto, and asks Flay why she's obeying a human. And this sets off a long, unskippable cutscene. One hour later, Flay is done with her speech. The dragon now believes that Haruto is the demon lord and apologizes for not fighting the war between humans and demons. She lived alone for 300 years and doesn't like conflict. She recounts that at first, she just slept in a cave. But then an adventurer dropped the book and she loved reading it so much that she left her cave and took on a human form so that she could go to a human village to read books. But while that may seem harmless, she still stole those books from the library. And one day adventurers found her and attacked, burning down her pile of stolen books in the process. Kind of hard to feel sorry for her. But Flay seems to be quite moved by the story and invites her to come live in Pandemonium. Haruto agrees to this, and the dragon swears her loyalty to him before transforming into a human. Haruto already knows what is going to happen. So before the fan service could kick in, he creates clothes for her. Afterwards, he names her Lisa. Flay gets jealous and tries to assert dominance here. But Haruto just tells them to follow him home for now. And while Lisa is able to sprout wings to follow him, Flay is stuck on the ground. When they get back to the castle, Haruto asks for permission to have Lisa work as a maid here. Gold is already way beyond questioning the things that Haruto does, so he says it is fine. Flay is now training Lisa to become a maid. But honestly, Flay already sucked at her job, so Lisa is immediately better at this than her. The food Lisa made is served to the family, and they all love it and praise her for her skill. Haruto's mother asks Lisa if she is good at anything else, and she says she is quite knowledgeable in basic magic. So she's made Charlotte's personal maid. The next morning, Lisa gets up to get Charlotte out of bed dressed for the day. They then go into the courtyard, and Lisa begins teaching Charlotte about basic magic and assisting her with her studies. And after a few lessons, Charlotte is already able to manifest a gigantic fireball. Herman appraises Lisa for her capability and apologizes for making her do so much work. But Lisa doesn't seem bothered by it and actually really enjoys moving around. Charlotte doesn't want to cause trouble for her, so she tells her to open up about any problems she may be having and asks to become friends with her. Harmino thinks about how Lisa is really dependable. Very good at learning and adapting and kind as well. He realizes that she is the perfect candidate to be his attendant. But she has already become friends with Charlotte, so he can't separate them anymore. But then he gets the idea to create a magic door to allow Lisa to return here to be with Charlotte and also his attendant at the same time. Later, Charlotte is feeling the depression of finishing her favorite series and is bored out of her mind. Liz informs her that she has to head back to the castle and Haruto finally gets around to telling her that he will be going to school next week. Charlotte gets some weird ideas in her head and calls a meeting of all of Haruto's subordinates. She tells them about Haruto going to school and Flay is upset that he didn't tell her first. She wonders why Ayo needs to go to school at all since he is the demon lord. But she forgets that she isn't supposed to tell Charlotte about that. Charlotte asks if there is anything she doesn't know about Haruto. But the others aren't giving up any information. Back to the matter at hand. Charlotte called the meeting because she is confused why Haruto would go to school willingly. She knows for a fact that he hates school with a passion. But his disdain for school only served to fuel Charlotte's imagination. And she now believes that there is a secret student council at the school which is leading students down the path of evil and stealing their souls or something. She thinks Haruto is going to go fright them and everyone believes her without a second thought. So Charlotte makes a plan for them to investigate it at the academy. But they don't ask Haruto about any of this. Lisa, as the only one there with more than two brain cells, actually goes to ask Haruto about it. But he decides not to tell the truth and makes up an excuse for why she must go with him to the academy. Haruto still plans to get kicked out as soon as possible, but at least his attendant issue is solved. Haruto is about to leave for the academy with Lisa and has hidden her tail and horns to prevent drawing attention to her. But she seems a little uneasy about having lost them. And Flay is over there in the corner crying about not being the one to go with Haruto. Meanwhile, in the royal capital, the princess barges into the prince's room to tell him that Haruto is on his way to the capital right now. He tries to act disinterested, but he was the one who went through all the trouble to get Haruto recommended to the academy. 
The prince has gone through a lot of character development since he got his ass handed to him by Haruto. So now he wants to go to the same school as him in hopes of learning a little about him. That's all. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to the latest Sander. But he's not the only one because the prince knows that Marion went on a whole tantrum until her father gave permission for Haruto to enroll. She tries to play it off and says it's not like she's in love with Haruto or anything. But the prince isn't stupid, so she basically just admitted that she loves Haruto. The conversation got real awkward real quick. So the prince changes the subject and asks if she has been alright with all the cultists doing cult things in the school, the Church of Lucifera. They are using the shield of calling themselves a religion to get away with a lot of shady things like tax evasion. And recently, they have been throwing around the idea of overthrowing the monarchy. And what's worse, it seems that the queen is a part of all this. The prince hasn't been able to figure her out since she had that collar put on her five years ago. And even before, he was already scared of her. But now she might be trying to crush the king altogether since they aren't on good terms and they don't know what to do about that. Marion thinks Horudo may be able to change things around a little since she thinks he has the power to possibly topple an entire nation, which she's not exactly wrong but she still has no proof of that. The prince brings up that he heard about a hero in Gold's province called the Black Knight and he might be able to resolve this situation if they asked for his help. The queen then comes into their room acting all nice but the reaction of the prince and Marion is like a psycho just walked in and yep, definitely a psycho. As the queen starts strangling Marion for looking at the collar on her neck, the prince begs her to let go of Marion, and she just says she was just joking around. She then talks to the prince who I'm just now realizing has gotten a lot be fire. She gets in close and tells him to learn everything he can about the black mage from Haruto, and tell her about it with a light death threat mixed in. What a perfectly functional family this is, right? The prince apologizes in his mind for getting Haruto involved with that crazy lady. Meanwhile, Haruto is still lounging around in his cabin. It would take a few days to get to the capital by carriage, but with barrier magic, he is able to create a door that allows him to teleport anywhere he wants to go. It's already been a few days, so he is scheduled to arrive at the capital anytime now. Flay is still begging to be taken with him instead of Lisa, but Haruto's decision is final and he doesn't want to go to jail for Flay's arsonist tendencies. So he heads through the door with Lisa and they end up in a forest near the capital. It is still quite a long walk to the gate, and they can't fly there because they would definitely be spotted. So Vic's just going to have to suffer through the trek. They notice some people being attacked by a bison that is looking for an easy meal and Haruto doesn't really care if they get eaten. But if Charlotte found out then, he would never hear the end of it. So he begrudgingly transforms into Black Knight and heads off to save them. Their cart loses a weedle so Black Knight uses some soft barriers to save a boy from falling first. A white-haired girl in the group then gets out and tries to distract the bison so that the others can escape. Black Knight sees her facing the bison and thinks she might be able to handle this alone so he doesn't have to be here. She was not able to handle it. She's about to get ran through by the bison but Black Knight knocks it out before it can harm her. He then heals the girl and she thanks him for his help. The kid also comes up to him and thanks him and Haruto still has a soft spot for kids. He does his pose and announces himself as Shiva here but no one responds. However, the kid liked it so he will call it a win. He then fixes the wagon and says he is going to take the bison back to its herd since it shouldn't be here. Later, he and Lisa arrive at the academy. It has one of the things Harvardo dreads the most crowded lines. His whole thing is literally draining the life out of Haruto. And after signing a mountain of paperwork, he finally gets his room. But he can't handle being here for another minute and heads back to the cabin, looking like a shriveled up raisin with another magic door. When he gets there, he asks Flay to cook something for him. But Charlotte suggests that they go to a restaurant in the capital, they have lunch at a restaurant and afterwards Charlotte pulls out a map and tells everyone to split up to monitor different sections of the city. She then goes with Haruto and grabs his hand saying it's a date. He takes a moment to process what she just said and then goes into full-on rationalization mode. They look different enough so no one would be able to tell if they are siblings. He has never been on a date before and most important of all, the DNA says it's not incest, so the date is a yes. Haruto is on cloud 9 because of his cute sister, but Charlotte accidentally bumps into the girl from the bison attack and she seems to recognize Haruto's magic power from before. But she is late for a job interview so she has to leave. As she goes, Charlotte remarks that there's something off about her, like she isn't just an ordinary person. But Haruto doesn't want to get involved with any special people so he's just going to stay in his room until the entrance ceremony. But before the ceremony, Haruto is required to take an aptitude test, and if he doesn't poorly, he might be kicked out of the school for lack of ability, which is exactly what he wants. Harbuto heads to the examination hall and is met by one examiner who has been waiting for him. He is given a test to finish and he is determined to fail it in spectacular fashion. 
But he didn't even need to try to fail cause he actually doesn't know how to answer these questions. So he just puts down don't know and don't care for all the answers on the first page. The second page is related to barrier magic, and they would probably figure out that something was up if he pretended not to know anything about barrier magic since that is his special magic. So he answered that page truthfully. Last is ancient magic. And Horgo thinks back to all the time that he spent studying ancient magic as an excuse to not go outside and before he knew it, he had accidentally answered all the questions on the paper correctly. The examiner then takes him to another room to have his magic examined and he is met by a girl who checks all the boxes to be a resident lolly. But don't worry, she's at least 50 years old. Her name is Tyriot Luciano, but that is a whole mouth full. So we will call her Tyr. She is a professor of ancient magic at the academy. So even with a recommendation letter, if Haruto gets on her bad side, she can have him expelled from the school. But that is all good news to Haruto. She is going to read his test answers to evaluate his magical knowledge. But after seeing his answers, she gets an intense look on her face. She says it's now time for the magic power evaluation and Haruto expects it to be two again. But this time the magic crystal just broke into pieces. Those magic crystals are expensive. So even though he didn't mean to break it, he is hoping that she will use it as an excuse to kick him out of the school. But unfortunately, she is way too reasonable for that, and is rather impressed by the amount of magic he possesses to be able to destroy a magic crystal. And after reading his answers, she remarks that the first page is some pretty high-level magic stuff, and it would be understandable to not know the answer. She is also impressed by the amount of balls it took to write I don't know in the test, and the second and third pages all have perfect answers on them. Tyr decides then and there that she will take Haruto under her wing as an assistant to her research. But Haruto is a certified shut-in, so he goes, hell no. You can do that by yourself. I'm out of here. Later, he fills his clone in on what happened, and it seems they made a good impression by accident. But all hope is not lost yet, and they will definitely find a way to get kicked out quickly. Clone Haruto now has to go to the entrance ceremony. From now on, we call them Haruto too. He doesn't want to do it, but since he is the clone here, he has no choice in the matter. At least he has the barrier that Haruto casts on him for protection and a magic gun for self-defense. He gets through the ceremony and now just has to return to his room. He sees a bunch of students walking in his direction, and that is a clear signal of the bullying plot development. So he tries to sneak past them, but the leader of the group calls the white-haired girl, and Haruto too gets roved into it. The blonde guy is angry that the girl didn't bow to him as he passed, but Haruto too wants no part of what this guy is saying, so he tries to fake being sick to escape. The guy sees through his fake sickness and is so enraged by it that he starts casting a spell. Hermito too isn't about to wait around to see what he is cooking so he makes a break for it, trying to escape. However, the fireballs still hit him but he is fine thanks to the defensive magic Haruto cast on him. However, Blondie isn't done cooking yet and fires off more spell, forcing Haruto too to defend himself in 360 no-scope his ass with the gun and after that he dips. Well, that was one hell of a first day. So Furunu too is going to take a much needed nap back in the cabin. A while later, Haruno receives a dual challenge from Blondie, but he wants no part in it, so he rejects it. However, his rejection was rejected as it would bring dishonor to gold, so he now has to fight. In the duel, Haruto notices the white-haired girl talking to the messenger and heading forward to Blondie's mansion, so he decides to keep an eye on her. In the mansion, Blondie is in pretty bad shape after getting 360 no scope by Haruto too. And the girl is trying to get him a call off the duel with Haruto. Blondie says he might consider her apology if she dances naked for him and she agrees to do it. I'm going to be honest. This is the first time I've seen events play out like this. She starts stripping down and has gotten to her bare chest. But Haruto can't stand to watch this anymore so he turns out the lights and yells at her to have some respect for herself. He tells her to get dressed so that he can take her back to her dorm. In the meantime, he is going to deal with Blondie. He places a vice on him which prevents him from using magic without severe pain as punishment for everything he did up till now and then leaves later. Hermundo is receiving a lot of praise for his trick shot against Blondie, whose name is Halfen. By now the entire school has heard about it, and it will definitely be replayed on the highlight reel for years to come. People can't believe that Haruto is actually only level 2 despite the level of power he displayed. Hermundo leaves the office disappointed since he thought he was being called to be expelled for being Hoffen. But he got praised instead and now there are school-wide rumors about him which can only lead to more main character moments so he wants to avoid it at any cost. However, before he can return to his room he is stopped by Tur, who still hasn't given up on having Haruto become her assistant. She explains to him that there are only two options in the academy. Either become a knight or lock yourself away in a lab to do research. But Haruto still doesn't want to join her regardless. 
as she's trying to force a contract on Haruto. Prince Laius spots him and tries to come in for a bro hug, but Haruto shuts that down real quick. Marion then comes over to apologize for Leia's behavior and Haruto notices that Leia's has been hitting the gym a lot. Marion asks Haruto if he has decided where he wants to study yet and when he says he hasn't, she invites him to join her research group. However, Leia's also wants Haruto to join his group and Terra isn't backing down either. They continue to fight over who will be taking Haruto to their group. But then the white-haired girl approaches Haruto because she wants to talk to him. Haruno has no idea why she wants to talk to him, but he takes the chance to get out of the situation and runs off with her, leaving Marianne worried that he might be in a relationship with her. Haruto and the girl make their way far from the academy and she asks him why he is different from yesterday. Haruto gets caught off guard by this and immediately creates a barrier around them. Out of instinct, he realizes that she was able to distinguish him from Haruto too. And when asked about it, she says she can feel immense pressure coming from him. The only other person to have said that was Flay, so he thinks the girl might be a demon. But she confirms that she is human. But onto more pressing matters, she wants to ask Haruto to be her friend and he is caught off guard once again and habitually agrees. She is really happy that he didn't turn her down since he is the first friend she has ever made. And Haruto wonders how anyone could be more of a loner than him. Her story is really similar to Haruto's as when she was a baby she was abandoned, but in her case, she got yeeted four separate times. If she had to think of a reason for it, it would be because she started speaking to communicate as a baby, the same thing Haruno did, only he didn't do it in front of humans. She ended up at a church. But Yum there they entreated her poorly, leaving her isolated from the outside world. So she kind of missed the memo on what common sense should be, which is why she was hoping to learn from a friend. But Haruno is also a loner so he's not sure what she would be able to learn from him. However, she is fine with learning together with him anyway and hopes that they can get along as friends. The idea of being friends with her isn't too bad and she is a lot better than the other options for friends he knows her so he is fine with it. He asks if she has decided what course she's going to be taking and she says she will be taking ancient magic which belongs to Ter. So he says he is going to go there as well and that makes the girl extremely happy. And for the first time, Haruto's heart beats for a smile that does not belong to his sister. He regains his composure and asks what her name is. Back at the log cabin, Charla is missing Haruto, so she decides to pop on over with a magic door. But Flay isn't allowed to come since she would most definitely cause property damage. As his servant, she is supposed to be by his side, but since he won't allow that, she is stuck with nothing to do. Her last job was to unify all the demons under the demon lord who was actually very kind towards both humans and demons. He dreamed of a world where both could live peacefully, but also resign himself to being defeated by the queen for the greater good. And Flay believes that demon lord was reborn as Haruto, and lost all the memories of his previous life. Lisa asks what the name of the demon lord was and she tells her that it was Iris Philia, which also happens to be the white-haired girl's name. So she is the actual reincarnation of the demon lord and also remembers her past as the demon lord. Our boy shortens her name to Iris and is about to walk away. But she wants to do their first friend activity and pick out classes together so Horundo invites her to his room. Charlotte was already sitting there watching and I'm and immediately thinks Iris is his new girlfriend, but he denies it. She then comes out and says that she plans to become Haruto's second wife in the future. Haruno isn't too excited to hear that, but he thinks this is at least better than her hating him and maybe she isn't that serious about it. She is very serious about it. Even Iris, who has zero life experience, can tell that something isn't right here. Anyway, they get to filling out their class forms and Haruto is taking the dinned approach since he doesn't care which classes he takes, he gets bored and just asks Charlo to do it for him instead. And she is more than happy to be of help to him. After that is done, Charlo leaves his room and Haruto covers Iris' eyes so that she doesn't see the magic door. They finish off the rest of the documents and are ready to begin school as brand new friends. The next day after spending the night, Haruto is dreading the reality that he has to be in school today as all students feel. At some point he knew it would be coming, but it doesn't make it any easier to deal with. Charlotte gets his attention and says she'll inform him of his schedule for the day. Based on his performance in the entrance exams, he is likely to be placed in C-class, which is about average, but classes are shuffled around based on regular exam performance, so Charlotte is sure he can advance to a class soon. But Haruno has no intention of doing anything of the sort. He takes a look at his courses, immediately realizes it was a mistake to let Charlotte register them for him because every single course he is taking now is high-level, panic attack-inducing calculus. She picked those classes because she thought Haruto would be able to breeze through them, but there's no way he is going to do all that crying. Although the more he thinks about it, this might work out in favor of his plan to get expelled from the school. 
If he selects all these high-level courses, the teachers will think he must be really smart and have high expectations of him to pass the classes, giving him the perfect opportunity to let them all down. He is about to set off to put his plan into action, but before he leaves, Charlotte gets his attention again and reminds him that he forgot something while opening her arms. Karuto turns around and gets his goodbye hug from her as she wishes him a good day at school. But is it just me, or is this hug lasting way too long? After 30 minutes of hugging, Haruno finally heads out and is met by Iris who greets him. She notices Liz next to him and asks who she is, which Haruno informs her that Liz is his attendant, meaning the reincarnation of the Demon Lord. Iris can tell that Liz is no human, but who is she to judge? If she's Haruto's attendant, then so be it. She greets Liz as well and they both walk to school together. On the way, Iris is shocked to learn that Haruto was put in C-Class despite the skill she knows he possesses. She herself was put in a class, but from what she had heard, written exams held the most weight in determining your overall grade, so she's sure he will eventually be joining her here. Haruno still isn't thrilled about the idea of getting moved to her class, but just says okay and waves goodbye as she enters a class. As she's leaving, Liz speaks up and says that no matter how many times she looks at her, she can't discern whether Iris is a human or a demon. So she asks what Haruo thinks. He doesn't really think she's a demon, but even if she were, she hasn't done anything evil yet, so it should be fine to leave things as they are. He makes his way to his C-class, and as he enters, all eyes are on him, likely because of that trick shot his clone pulled off. He just wants to lay low in class for a while, but as the teacher begins his introductions to the class, he states how Class C is right in the middle between the best and the worst the school has to offer. So to see where they fall, he's going to have to assess them, and to do that, he'll have them all take an assessment test. Take a moment to think about how crazy it is to get pop quiz on the first day of school, but this works out in favor of his plan to fail the class. He'll show them just how incompetent he truly is and say goodbye to this school forever. But as he takes a look at the questions, the questions are way too easy. These are the kind of questions Chartalot was able to cover in six months, just after she learned how to read. He wonders what the teacher was thinking to put such simple questions on a test, but he also thinks the teacher might be trying to reassure the students with questions that they can't possibly fail. This makes it a little hard to know how to respond here. If he starts failing questions that are so easy and the school might start to suspect that he is doing it on purpose, so he comes up with a plan to find a balance between right and wrong answers 60% correctly. After the test is over, the teacher takes a look and says he is very disappointed. Out of the whole class, barely anybody managed to get above 20%. But then again, he isn't surprised because even B-class students would only be able to average a 50 on this kind of test. Harvardo hears this and can't believe what his ears are hearing because that means his score is actually the best in class as confirmed by the teacher, who calls him out by name. The students clap for his achievement and he starts to realize what went wrong with his plan. It's not necessarily that his classmates are a bunch of idiots. Well, maybe a little, but the real reason is because Charlotte is just way too smart, so the things he learned with her are actually advanced questions. The teacher promises that with his outstanding performance, he'll make sure to put a good word for Haruto to be able to move up to class A before the next lesson begins. And just like that, 20 minutes after the first day of school, he had been promoted to a class. As soon as he sets foot on the class, he is spotted by Iris and Ringheart, and they immediately grab him, fighting over who gets to have Haruto. Their argument is cut short, however, when Professor Oratoria announces her presence. She introduces her as their teacher, and an elemental magic theory expert. But Haruto is just upset because he can already tell that this teacher is going to be a pain in the ass. She singles out Haruto, Iris, and Renhard for being only first years, but having signed up for her incredibly advanced class and still having the nerve to sit in the very front row while chatting away. The moment they fail to answer even one of her questions, she will be throwing all three of their dumbasses out. And as for Haruto and Iris, she had heard they joined Kira's research group and she's got beef with that lowly, so she's going to take it out on the two of them. After her rant, Orgatoria starts class and says they'll begin with main elements and sub-elements, and they will also be learning about quantification. So she calls Iris out to put her hand in the crystal ball. She approaches the desk and does as she was asked, revealing that she possesses all the elements possible, but it looks like her mana is only at a 5. Tori changes her opinion of Iris really fast and starts asking her to join her research group, but Iris refuses, which may have been partially due to her previous threats. Tori moves on and says the element 1 is most proficient at is their main element, meaning it's the one they are strongest with. But alas, that is that the crystal is able to show. If the proficiency with the main element is taken as 100%, then how well can they control the sub-elements? There is currently research being done to calculate this, but has proven to be quite difficult, though Haruto doesn't see why it would be hard to do so. 
It uses his mana calculator and it seems to display the information just fine. Tori continues her lecture and says, Part of the reason it is so hard to quantify a person's proficiency in a particular element. This is because certain factors can change the proficiency of a person's magic. It was originally thought to have something to do with mastery of the spell, but research has shown that to be false. Herbuler thinks about it and concludes that it must be due to hidden properties then. But he was being smart a little too loud and Toru managed to hear him blowing up in a frenzy to get Haruto to repeat himself. He's messed up. His mana calculator also shows some attributes that he hasn't been able to figure out, so he just calls them hidden factors. So far, he has only ever spoken to Charlotte and the others about it, but now he screwed up and mentioned it in front of this lunatic. He is pressured so he answers honestly about thinking elements can have hidden properties that lead to varying levels of effectiveness when used. But Tor just shakes him harder and questions how he has that information when all the top minds in the country are just coming up with this theory. There is a strange figure that sends them research results every couple of years that is decades ahead of anything they could ever accomplish themselves. They've been studying this with the utmost caution. They haven't even told the royal family yet. Bakura high schooler figured it out in 10 minutes. She is amazed by Haruto's insight and asks him to join her research group once again. Those threats she made earlier aren't doing her any favors. Plus, it's technically against school rules to recruit students to your research group. During class, Tori questions if Haruto might be the mysterious figure that was sending the research, but while it wasn't him, he has a good idea of who could have been behind it. Seeing what the other professors are like, Haruto later goes to hand the paperwork to join Tier's research group, and she is excited that she now has enough members to keep the research group going. So to celebrate, she decides to hold a welcome party for them and puts Polkos in charge of it, leaving Haruto and Iris just standing there. They decide to just sit and read, and Haruto too is annoying that he had to come into school today when it was meant to be the original Haruto here for the day. But laziness got the better of him, so member two had to come hand in his application. But speaking of which, he has technically done what he was sent here to accomplish, so he should be fine to leave. But before he can get away, he hears a scream from Polkos and now has to go investigate because he was still here. They find Blondie, otherwise known as Schneel, lying on the floor nearly lifeless. Tur had forgotten he was just lying on the floor there. He had come to her because he was afflicted by some strange magic, so he assumed it must be ancient magic and she would have some insight on it. But all he got was a lot of testing done on him by Tyr, leaving him in his current state. And since he just so happens to be unconscious, she wants to demonstrate why you never want to be the first person to fall asleep at the sleepover. She begins experimenting on him and shows that there are barriers that attract each other in his shoulder whenever he tries to use magic, but inanimate objects pass straight through it. She asks Iris what she thinks it could be, and based on what she has seen so far, she thinks it could be non-elemental barrier magic. Haruno too is impressed that Tyre was able to identify the true properties of the barrier magic and a little concerning, considering he is made of barrier magic. She asks Haruto if he can tell what the difference is between ancient magic and more modern magic, but this isn't the smart one so he's having trouble answering the question. To put it simply, ancient magic isn't elemental in nature, making it special, but it's also said that this type of magic doesn't require constant magic input to sustain itself. And that's why she believes the magic that was used on Schneil was actually ancient magic. Otherwise, anyone who casts something like this would have easily run out of magic after only half a day. But this magic was placed on Schneil almost two days ago, meaning there must be someone alive right now that is capable of casting ancient magic. Tur is speculating on who could possibly have the power necessary to use such magic, but Iris clearly denies having the capability to use such powerful magic, and Tyre can tell that she is being sincere. So she turns to ask the guy who saw the culprit himself. She grabs him and proceeds to smack the shit back into his body. After regaining consciousness, he recalls all the horrific experiments Tar did to him and threatens her with his family's position. However, she isn't very scared, since if her unethical scientific practices had ever had consequences before, she would be on death row. She gets straight to the point and asks Shneel who it was that did this, but he isn't sure. All he knows is that it was a strange man covered in black from head to toe. That description coincidentally matches that of a reported hero of justice that was running around in Haruto's father's kingdom. And even more coincidentally, he started to appear in the capital. Soon after, Haruto also arrived. She may be short, but she would beg out any NBA player when it comes to leaping to conclusions. She is on to him and pressuring him to admit that he is actually the hero of justice. And Haruto number two is freaking out because of all these social interactions. Luckily, the original Haruto had a plan ready for a situation like this and has Shiva make an appearance in the research room to clear himself of any suspicions. He tells Schneel that if he calls off the duel he had set with Haruto, 
that he will undo the binding and left with no other choice. He agrees to do so with that was about to take his leave, but he was then caught in a binding spell by Tur. She is very proud of her binding spell and she plans to keep Shiva trapped here until he answers all her questions about him. But Shiva had other plans and breaks free from the binding, trapping her in an invisible barrier as well. Tur is slightly threatened but turned on at the same time and offers her chastity to Shiva if he will answer her questions, but he doesn't seem very interested. She then realizes that she needs to go to the bathroom, but if Shiva doesn't undo his binding, she's going to wet herself, so she promises not to investigate him anymore. After successfully not wetting herself in front of her students, they finally have that welcome party that she was planning to do for Iris and Haruto. While sitting, Haruto asks Pokos why he is always around Tyr. He begins explaining the long story of how he met Tyr. He had been hired by her family to be a private tutor several years ago. But as he tried to teach the young girl, he soon realized that he was far outmatched by her intellect and was about as useful as a glass of water in a river. So she enrolled at the academy to take advantage of the resources available. But with all the resources she had at her disposal, she had to go and pick ancient magic. No one even knows if the magic is still useful, so she ended up as the laughingstock of the school. Hermit of two tries to cheer him up by saying normal people could never understand the mind of a genius, but that only makes Polkos even more upset. Now it's gotten really awkward in here, but luckily Iris comes over to make things awkward in a whole new way. She's been drinking a lot and realizes that she loves alcohol a lot. She offers Haruto a sip, but he declines so she pours herself another cup. She then remembers that she wants to thank Haruto for being friends with her and drops her knees while bringing her head close to Haruto 2's lap. He is freaking out, but then Iris just falls asleep, which gives him relief, but also some disappointment. After putting her to sleep on the couch, Tar comes up to him and starts talking to Haruto about Iris and the theory she has on why she chose to join this research group in the first place. From her aptitude test, she found that Iris has an aptitude for every single element there is, which is an incredibly rare trait to possess. Maybe even enough to call her a hero in the making. But life often doesn't go so conveniently. So despite her high number of aptitudes, her mana is only at a 5 out of 35. Being a teenager and having such a low level means it likely won't be able to increase more than what it already is. And that is why she believes Iris came to the Ancient Magic Research Crew in hopes of uncovering some sort of ancient secret that could lead her to a breakthrough in her level. Though that's just a hypothesis and something she wouldn't normally just blurt out either. But due to all the alcohol in her system, she's just saying whatever comes to mind. So before she accidentally blurts out the formula to something that violates the Janema convention, she decides to take a nap to sleep off all the alcohol in her system. Elsewhere that night, Schneel is furious over having to call off the duel with Haruto. And he knows everyone in school will soon learn about it and start making fun of him for being scared. He went through a lot, even siding with the Church of Lucifero in order to make sure his father would be the next king of the kingdom. But then Haruto and Shiva had to come in and mess up his plans. But really, Haruto doesn't give a damn about him. And he would have been fine to keep doing what he was doing if he just hadn't messed with Iris. And his brain must have gone on vacation for the holidays because he decides it would be a good idea to send assassins after Haruto. After he just got free from his punishment, which he received for threatening to harm Haruto. He gives the orders for the assassins to go and eliminate Haruto and the others in the research group. But in the corner, we see one of Haruto's camera barriers recording the whole thing. The assassins head to fulfill their mission and close in on the building. They see the targets all laid out drunk. After a celebration, Haruto seems to be asleep on the sofa. They have cast a sound barrier around the entire building to ensure that no one is able to hear any of their activities this night. They also have at least 20 of the most elite members of their organization here. So the job should be easy enough to accomplish. They move out to commence the operation. But as one runs full speed towards the building, he crashes face first into a barrier that had been set up around the building. They investigate it a little. It is a barrier that surrounds the building entirely and they can't even scratch the thing. Just then, a door suddenly appears. And I don't know about you, but this situation reeks of trap. The assassins were informed that Shiva would be protecting Haruto, so the leader asks them to proceed with caution. As one of them opens the door, he gets dragged in where you can only presume that he was immediately killed. The rest of the assassins see this and shoot a fireball at the door in hopes of destroying it, but their fire is just absorbed. Now behind them dozens of floating doors appear, and they are all pulled in one after another. The leader keeps his cool and focuses on finding the person behind all the doors, and as he locks onto it, he shoots a fireball at what he believes to be Shiva. But there are now dozens of Shivas coming from the doors, and he is greatly confused but fires at them nonetheless. They all fall to the ground. He finds that the people he just shot down were his own teammates. 
He then hears a voice above his head and looks up to find the real Shiva sitting in the air. He tries to attack him, but gets bound by one of Shiva's barriers and is left immobile. He can't believe Shmile would be so stupid as to send an assassin group after him. So he's got a lot of questions he once answered. All the assassins were apprehended. So Shiva pulls up to Shmile's house and dumps their bodies on the ground. He asks Shmile if he knows why they are here right now, but he tries to feign ignorance and claim that he has never met any of these people before in his life. However, Shiva has concrete video evidence proving that he was the one who ordered the assassins to go and kill them, so he won't be able to weasel his way out of this one. And really, was it necessary to send assassins after them over a simple grudge? He clearly didn't learn anything from the last punishment he was given, so he's going to have to receive a more strict form of punishment. Schneil doesn't want to even begin to imagine what form of cruelty that Shiva would inflict upon him. So he walks over to a needle he kept stashed away in a wooden case and Shiva was so intrigued that he just let happen. Shile injects himself with some form of power-enhancing drug that causes his power to rise far above what he would normally be capable of, but as a side effect turns him into a grotesque monster. He punches Shiva through the wall and out into the courtyard. It turned out to be way more horrific than he had thought, so he wants to just kill this thing and get home to go to sleep. But he then receives a call from Charlotte asking him what's going on. It's past her bedtime, but she says she had a feeling Haruto was going to go fighting for justice or something, so she couldn't help herself. Coincidentally, he actually is fighting a huge monster and Charlotte asks if he is going to save it. He wasn't planning to before, but now that she has asked him to do it, he decides he might as well try to get Schmile back to normal. He engages in battle with a monster and dodges around it, strikes until he gets hit and is sent flying into a wall. This monster form of Schmile is way stronger than he was before, so Shiva goes for a barrier enhanced punch, but it doesn't do much and he is caught in the arms of the monster. To free himself, he uses his barrier magic to surround his arms and pull them apart. He's now about his arms restrained, so he thinks this battle must be over. But he couldn't be more wrong because the monster then rips off his own arms, regenerates them and continues fighting. Charlo calls Shiva and asks if he noticed anything weird. After the monster regenerated itself, its body shrank and it got paler, leading them to being that if they are able to cut off all of the overgrown parts, then Schnile should be able to return him to his original form. Now that he has a clear idea of what to do in order to save Schneel, he begins to chant and calls upon his unlimited blade works. The sky reddens as thousands of blades and a rubber mallet for some reason descend from the sky and slice Schneel up. And after he is done with the rubber mallet landing on his head, Schneel has been perfectly restored back to his normal human form. To be honest, the idea of cutting a guy up to return him to normal seemed far-fetched, but Shiva is glad all worked out. In the end, Shalak calls to thank him for such an amazing show. Though there was some light in the way so she couldn't see everything and Haruto has never been more happy to see the holy light of censorship doing its job. Trellet goes to sleep, leaving Shiva to clean up the mess that is Smile sitting naked in the courtyard. He tries to get his attention, but Smile's mind has returned to Monkey, so he no longer wants to deal with him. He decides to just pick up the evidence and fix the mansion up before anyone notices and go back to sleep. The next day, somewhere in the royal capital, Flay is doing some intel recon by yelling at an old man in the streets. This is obviously getting them nowhere, so they resort to more reliable means and beat the answers out of some local hoodlums. One of the hoodlums ended up knowing something about the current situation in the royal capital, and the team now has intel that the queen and king are not on good terms right now, and additionally, there has been some unrest among the aristocracy, meaning everything Charlotte predicted is true, and the doomsday of the royal capital is fast approaching. They plan to infiltrate. This evil syndicate is apparently real, according to Tyre, so he's going to have to keep an eye on things to make sure Charlo doesn't get hurt. But if it means he'll finally get a chance to relax, then he is ready to take on the world for all that matters. The end thanks for watching. Subscribe for more and I'm recaps.